Good morning, and thank you for tuning in to Do You Know My Father? Today we're in t- part two of uh, Pride, and uh, last time we looked at uh, part one, and we looked at what is pride, and why does pride exist, and where does pride come from, what causes it, what causes the fall of uh, the devil, what causes the fall of mankind. Then we looked at different words that had to do with pride and where we see it in the Bible and its usage. And uh, we left off with being uh, talking about being humble and not prideful. They're two opposites. It's not that there's a good pride and a bad pride. It's that pride is evil, period. Um, we said that the devil's the father of all the children of pride. We said that... Um, Several things. God said pride is an evil thing, uh, so it's not a good thing. Humility is, though, to be humble, to be meek. That's a good thing, to be under God's authority. Okay? So today we start in Matthew 10, or I'm sorry, Matthew 20, verse 25 through 27. But Yahashua called them unto him and said, You know that the prince of the Gentiles exercised dominion over them, And they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister, your servant. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. The word minister means servant. Is your pastor a servant? Is the leader you have a servant? The Messiah's example to us was that of a suffering servant. Even though he is king of kings, His example to us was that he washed his disciples' feet. If you want to be great or you want to be a leader, you have to be a humble servant. I'll say that again. If you want to be a leader that God values, you will be a humble servant, not a dictator. Pride of intellect and abilities. Let's talk about that. Many people take pride in their intellect, their knowledge, and their abilities. They speak of how proud they are of themselves for this or for that. King Nebuchadnezzar was one of these people. You can read about it in Daniel chapter 5. We must understand that God gives us every breath that we breathe. We really can't do anything without him. And he says so in John 15, 5. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. But with God, all things are possible, it says in the Scriptures. It also says in the Scriptures that I can do all things through Yahushua Messiah who strengthens me. Philippians 4, verse 13. I know it's hard for people to believe that because they think, well, I can do all kinds of things by myself. They're so proud can't do much without breathing and he gives us every breath we breathe he's given us life i have a yearbook from high school the high school that i went to and in it the valedictorian valedictorian says she has always been smart and a good student she doesn't know why she just always has been the scripture says all good gifts come down from the father of lights that's james 117 James 1.17, read it. All good gifts come down from the Father of lights. Now this was a top student, someone who doesn't even acknowledge God and his blessings toward her and the abilities he has given her. That's sad, people. That's what this is, pride of intellect. There's no room for God in it. See, And some people will, will do this. Not everybody does that. Like I said, some people do it, but I think there's many. I was talking to a pastor not that long ago, and I know this man. He has the gift of administration. You can read about that in 1 Corinthians 14. With the gift of administration, this guy can accomplish more than five guys working together that do not have the gift. This man said, I've always prided myself in my ability to get all these things done. See, he did it too. And this is a pastor. 
No different than the valedictorian, because people have lost what the scriptures have taught, what God wants us to know. Scripture says, why do you act like you haven't received it when you have? That's 1 Corinthians 4, 7. 1 Corinthians 8, 1 says, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifies, love edifies. If we love God, we're going to edify his name. We're going to lift, we're going to lift him up. You know, we're going to lift up his name and give him the glory. Never to act like we just know how to do this stuff and we're real proud of ourselves. That's not the right heart. Here in this verse, it says that knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. This reminds me of Job 36, 4. Now, Job was going through the biggest trial of his life. He had just lost all his children, his wealth, his health. His wife was left alive just to try and finish him off with her foolish words. Then his so-called friends and comforters come by with their smack talk. Poor Job sitting there, and what does Elihu do, the youngest of the comforters? He says, For truly my words shall not be false. He that is perfect in knowledge is with thee. Talk about puffed up. This guy was full of pride. He didn't love Job. He just came to tell everyone how smart he was. That's not what we need. When you're down, you need somebody that loves you, that cares for you, and wants to speak the truth in your life and not condemn you. It says in the Bible that the people that have not, they're still in their sins that don't know God, they're condemned already and the wrath of God abides them. They're already condemned. What they need is the saving power of God in their life. And if that's you, put your trust in the day. Start reading his word and start praying to him. He will set your path straight. He loves you and he'll help you. In 1 Corinthians 13, verse 2, it says that if a person understands all ministry, all mysteries and has all knowledge and doesn't have love, he's nothing. This was Eliehu. He didn't even know, he didn't know the things he thought he knew anyway. But he thought he did. But he didn't really have love for Job. I'm not saying that knowledge is bad. Knowledge is a good thing. As long as it's coupled with love. I mean, there's even a gift by the Spirit, a gift of knowledge. You know? He says, my people destroy themselves for lack of knowledge. He wants us to have knowledge. But it's but it, what the thing is, is he doesn't want us to be all prideful about it. God loves us and he wants to give us good gifts, but he can't give us something that would destroy us because we're puffed up about it. We need to be humble, and then we can receive good things from God. And even greater things. He says, if you're faithful a little, I'll give you more. If you wanna if you wanna have power, it's the wrong heart. But if you want to love God, He'll give you power. And if you have power, you gotta have a humble heart to handle it. Because if you start getting puffed up with pride, you'll fall in the same thing the devil did. Okay. So if you have knowledge but no love, you'll exalt yourself and you'll look down on others. This is because they do not know what you know. But if you have love coupled with knowledge, you will share your knowledge humbly with others. That's what I'm trying to do now. Some people say knowledge is power. They go for years of schooling to get it. But without love, it's worthless. The world has a fake idea about what love is. Real love is to love like Yahashua loves. You can only learn that from Yehovah himself. Love is not positive or negative. If you love someone... You should tell them the truth, even if it seems negative to them. I mean, when somebody has a something out of place in their back or a thing out of joint, you have to set the bone. You have to set the bone if it's broken. You have to, if you're going to a chiropractor and you need adjustment because it's out of adjustment, it hurts, but it's got to be done. So, you know, it may feel like it's going to be a bother, but, you know, del love delights in the truth and not in evil. So we've all gotten out of joint, and we all need to put back in. But what it is is we don't want to look at the present pain that we're in. We want to look at him who loves us and wants us to walk the right way. He's going to allow suffering in your life. 
He even, gives, he even designed us to have growing pains when we start to grow physically. When you have spiritual growing pains, it hurts as well. But we must grow. Okay? You know, people think they have the knowledge. They think they have the degree. They should get the job. That's not so. I would rather hire someone that has godly character any day, regardless of any degree they have. Now, that doesn't mean that a person that has some degree or, or something, it doesn't have godly character. I'm not saying that at all. Please don't misunderstand me. The main thing, though, isn't the, the degree. The main thing is the godly character, okay? If they have godly character and they have uh, knowledge in something, that that's great. They've been trained in something. I mean, look at the craftsmen today. There's there's not much craftsmen. I mean, we have all these books for dummies. I mean, anybody can do it. But what about the craftsmen? There was a certain uh, secrets of the trade that they had to build things and do things. Now that's looked down upon. We found a way that anybody can do something, an easy way, but it's not as good a quality a lot of times. Okay, let's move on. Pride of wealth. People who have the sin of pride of wealth exalt themselves based on their riches and they look down on others that are poor or do not have as much as they do. And once again, I'm not going to say that everybody that is rich is like this. There are people that are humble, that have riches, and they love the poor and they give to the poor. I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about people that are prideful in their wealth, okay? More time than not, money is their God. It's what they focus on. It's what drives them and what they base their decisions on. Their happiness is based on if they have money or they don't. It's really not that hard to see what your heart is given to. Are you happy when you have money and unhappy when you don't? Luke chapter 12, verse 15 says, Take heed and beware of covetousness. It's one of the Ten Commandments. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. It's not about your stuff. Do your possessions possess you? Think about that. Or do you possess them? For example, I have a log splitter. If someone stole it, I wouldn't be overjoyed. But if God told me to give it to someone, would I be the cheerful giver? Would it take me a while to get my heart in line with God's will? Someone may say, well, I will give them this, but I will not give them that. Be careful about that. God gives and he takes away. If your heart is set on someone or something more than him, he may take it away from you. And when he does, sometimes sometimes people hate God the rest of their life for that because they lift it above him and they won't repent of their idolatry. He may take it away from you if you hold it up. And even if that's only temporary until he straightens things out in your heart, you know, we have to put him first. That's the greatest commandment, to put him first. And, you know, to love him, to put him first. And if we don't, then we're in idolatry. Now, I think about Jonathan, Saul's son. Even though he knew that he would be king after his father, he gave, it, gave up his right to the throne. And in his heart, the kingdom was David's. All this was in line with God's will. And Jonathan gave it with the right heart. I believe that Jonathan would have made a very fine king. When I say that Jonathan gave it, it wasn't rightfully his to give it because God had already given it to David type of thing. I know, but what I'm saying is he let go of something that he figured for sure would be his. There's so many people that would, would hold on to that, you see. So many people in Jonathan's position would have hated David, but he didn't. He loved David. The biggest sacrifice of anyone was the father sending us his son. And Yahashua giving up his life on the cross or the stake. The point is the, he gave up his life. This brings up another question. Are you content with what you have? And trust Jehovah to increase your wealth. Or are you trying to increase yourself? 
The scripture says in Psalm 62.10, Trust not in oppression and become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. So the rich rule over the poor and they oppress the poor. We're not to oppress anybody. John the Baptist told the, the soldiers, don't be taking things by force that you shouldn't be taking. The tax collectors, don't take more than you should. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. That means if they increase, that means you wasn't setting your heart upon them in the first place. It means you're humble and you're not chasing after that. That's not your God. 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 12. But godliness with contentment is great gain. It's a different kind of gain, but it's, it's a great gain. Because you become godly. You become like your father. I didn't say you become your father. You become like him. Okay? For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Death and taxes. Death and taxes. Everybody dies. You're going to die someday. And you ain't taking it with you. Now, I know people in Egypt, they would put a bunch of stuff in their coffins with them and even kill servants and put them in there with them so they'd have servants in the afterlife, this whole reincarnation. It's all garbage. You don't take nothing with you. You don't take anything with you. And you're not going to come back as a drop of rain or anything else. After death comes the judgment. We got one shot at this. There's not different opportunities. There's not. There's no coming back as an elephant or coming back as a dog or coming back as a somebody that you thought was better looking than you were. None of, there's none of this. There is no reincarnation. That's all a lie of Hinduism. But in many religions, they believe these kind of things, and it's just not true. So right now is your life, and you're living it, and you need to live it for God. Because after you die, you will be judged by him. Okay? And having, and, and having food and raiment, let us there be with content. Food and clothes. I said be content. You're clothed. You have food. For they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. And into many foolish and hurtful lusts, lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil. It says the love of it, not money itself, but the love of it, don't ever forget that, is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You think about the cats in the cradle and the silver spoon, little boy blue and the man on, on the moon. When you're coming home, Dad, don't know when, but we'll get together then. Just even that song, remember that? He didn't have time for his son. He was gone, 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 making money, 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 and he didn't have time. And now he finally retired. He'd come home, which I don't believe you should retire. I think you should keep on working, but working the right way, not like chasing after money. And then his son was doing the same thing he saw his dad do. And he said, son, when are you going to come and see me? He said, I don't know, dad, but we'll get together when that happens. And, and he was, he said, my boy grow up, grow up just like me. See, we pass this stuff on. They're watching. And they, they end up being like us. And that could be a good thing or a bad thing. But all the son really wanted was to be with his father. That's what I want. I want to be with my father. I've come to find out that all of us down here are, are wrecked in so many ways. Even if we try to be like him, we need his spirit for that. So many people are trying to be like God and they don't even have a spirit living in them. You know, David said it very well. He said, I, I want to dwell in your house forever. He said, I want to inquire at your temple. I want to ask you questions. He said, I want to gaze upon your beauty. There ain't nobody like you. That's the way it is. He says, but thou, O man of God, flee these, these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. So if you're chasing after money, you don't, you're not falling after love. You may think so, but you're not. Well, I give some of my stuff away and just so you can justify why you keep running after money. Stop doing it. You're just tricking yourself. 
Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Money itself is not evil. It is the love of money that is evil. The word here talks about someone who desires to be rich. Someone that is greedy and idolizes money. It says they pierce themselves. When you chase money, it is like piercing yourself with many knives. In verse 11, it talks about true riches. Riches that are eternal, guys. Eternal. You know, it talks about rust, moths, and thieves in the scriptures, remember? That fancy hot rod that some people shine up, it's going to rust no matter what. Uh, you can still enjoy it, whatever, but it says store up treasure in heaven. The rest is going to get it. Moths. People go out and buy new clothes. When they got clothes in their closet that they've never wore, still got the tags on them, the moths are going to destroy it. It says store up treasure in heaven. It says thieves can break up steel. You can store up treasure on earth and thieves can break in and steal. What you store up in heaven will not rust or decay. When you're clothed with Messiah, it, the moths can't destroy it, guys. You store up treasure on earth. Thieves, can't, thieves can break in and steal, but you store up in heaven. They can't break in and steal it. What treasure we have in these earthen vessels, the Holy Spirit in our bodies, cannot be taken away unless we believe the lies of Satan instead of the truth of God. Fire will either destroy or it will refine. We will continue to be refined as silver or gold by the fire of the Spirit of God that burns bright within us. The unbeliever is like the wood, hay, or the straw. He will be burned up by eternal fire because he resisted the indwelling presence of our God, who is a consuming fire. This is not to say that we shouldn't be good stewards of what God has blessed us with, of course. We should be good stewards of every person, place, and thing that we've been blessed with. We should take care of and be thankful for them. For God has said, be faithful with a little and he will give you more in Matthew 25, 21 and Luke 19, 17. Matthew 6, verse 19 through 21 says, Lay not up for yourselves treasure upon earth where moth rust doth corrupt and wherein thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will be your heart also. So that's the scripture for that, Matthew 6, 19 to 21. The right balance must be in all things. The balance comes as wisdom, knowledge, and understanding increase in us. The more we read and meditate on scripture, the more God will reveal to us his righteousness in all situations. Some things are evil to even have in our possession. Other things, it is the usage of those things whether we use a certain thing to do evil or good. For instance, a Playboy magazine is an evil invention. There's nothing good about it. We as believers should not even possess such things. However, a firearm is not evil in itself. If you use the firearm to hunt meat for your family, it is not evil. If you use it to murder the old lady across the street for a diamond necklace, it's evil. With some things, it is hard to get the balance. But the exciting thing is our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has all the answers. As we walk with him, he will reveal it. He'll tell you. 1 Corinthians 4, 6 through 7. And these things, brethren, I have in figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another, for who maketh thee to differ from one another? And what hast thou that thou did not receive? No, Now if thou did receive it, why does thou glory as if thou had not received it? So if you've ever heard someone says, I don't know why, but I've always been smart or strong or wealthy. I've just always been good at this or that. We need to realize that we are made by God and we all have different gifts that have been given to us by God. 
We are to give him the glory for those gifts. So be of a humble heart and use the gifts God has given you for his glory, for the edification of others. Don't pride yourself in your spiritual gifts. Praise the one who gave it to you. I used to be pretty strong physically, but I didn't acknowledge God. I didn't give him the glory. I would never ask people for help. I thought I could do everything myself. I was so wrong. God began to break me physically to make me strong in him spiritually, see. The scripture says his strength is made perfect in my weakness, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. So when I'm weak, then he makes me strong, and I can do all things through Yahashua Messiah, who strengthens me. Apart from him, I can do nothing. He gives me every breath I breathe. He gives me free will to honor or dishonor him with that breath. One scripture that really was a comfort after losing the strength that I had was, and still is, Jeremiah 9, verse 23 to 24. Thus saith Jehovah, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am Yehovah, which exercises loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For these things I delight, saith Yehovah. So if you have wisdom, might, riches, don't forget the giver of those things, guys. 1 Timothy 6, 17. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, another term for pride, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. This scripture says we should glory that we know and understand that Yahashua said to know him is eternal life. That's John 17, 3. And that there would be many that would say, Master, Master, and he would say, I never knew you. Remember to know him. Not everyone that saith to me, Master and Master, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. He that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Master, Master, have we, we, did we not prophesy in thy name? And then thy name has cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works, a lot of good works. He said, and then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Means wickedness. This is how we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments. What does God say about pride? There are seven things that God hates. In that list, in Proverbs 6, verse 16 through 18, it is a proud look. You can't have a proud look unless you have pride in your heart, right? Romans 1, 29, 32, being filled with the unrighteousness, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornications, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud. See that? Proud. Boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do they do the same things, but they have pleasure in them that do them. You can read that Romans 1, 29 through 32. 2 Timothy 3, 2 through 4. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, there it is again, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. James 4, 6. God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. 
You want to be humble, not prideful, folks. You don't want God resisting you, so don't resist him. You see and hear the word proud everywhere as if it's a good thing, don't you? Proud to be an American? I'm not prideful as if I've done anything on my own or that I'm better than any people in another country. I'm thankful to God that I live in this country. This country has truly been blessed by God, but because of the great moral decline, it's turned its back on God. It's ripe for destruction. No matter how ungodly this nation gets, there will still be people yelling, God bless America, as a statement instead of praying to God to heal this land and the hearts of the people to be turned to him, you see. You'll hear the saying, I didn't hurt anything but my pride. We hurt our pride because we have trusted in ourselves and our own abilities, and we have fallen like the word says will happen. The right response is to see that what happened was because of our pride. We need to ask God to forgive us with a humble heart and thank him for the abilities he has given us knowing that we're only going to have times when we make mistakes, yes, but we got to get back up and keep going in his strength, not ours. I'm proud of you, son. You've heard that. How many times have you heard it or said it? I'm proud of you, son. This is literally saying I'm taking the glory for what, just, what you just did and lifting that person at the same time. So many people are proud of someone who did something that was totally ungodly. That doesn't line up with the scriptures. Is what was done to the glory of God? Was it truly a good thing in the sight of God? He what example did the father give us towards his son? He said, this is my son whom I'm well pleased. You can look it up. It's when he was baptized by John the Baptist. It says, this is my son whom I'm well pleased. I'm pleased with you, son. That should be the right statement. It says, let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be pleasing in his sight. Well, it says, if you're going to speak, speak the words of God. So we need to align our speech with his words, okay? Just that simple. I'm pleased with you, son. What is the motive of our hearts? If it's something one of my children did and it was truly good in the sight of God, I would thank God for what he did through me in training my child. I would thank God that my child had received it and applied it, bringing him glory. The proper heart is rejoicing in what God has done and what he is going to do. This is a humble position. This is the believer's position. There's no room for pride because if we are prideful, we cut God out of it, guys. This is applied anywhere. It's applied anywhere. People say, I pride myself in this. I pride myself in that. I don't know why. I've just always been good at that. You know, and they don't want to give God the glory for their abilities. You got the U.S. Marines, the few and the proud. Why can't it be the few and the humble? We should not be proud of these men. We should be thankful to them for laying down their lives to defend this country. The many freedoms we have today. I know this goes against your grain. It's not my words. God said anyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to him. He's first. Not any, any military group. He is first. And really the fact is, that they've stolen our sons and daughters. Families should stand up against what needs to happen to protect themselves and their communities and their nation. Not giving up our children to fight up our family more, killing our sons and daughters for wars that were started by rich people. That's the facts, but nobody wants to own this. I know it goes against your grain because you want to think, my, my husband, my brother, my son died for a good cause when it was really over liars that lied to us over their oil fields and their other little rich get-rich-quick scheme propositions or just yield power and destroy the family to break us all to communism. Wake up, people. God said anyone proud in his heart's an abomination. Live with it. Deal with it. Come out of this. It's a detestable thing. People say, at least I've still got my pride. The one thing they didn't want to get rid of 
is one thing that brought them low down to nothing. This saying is based on a person believing that every, even though they've lost everything, they will still have not lost their pride as if it's a good thing. It is not. Well, you should be proud of such and such. No, you shouldn't. Hometown Pride IGA. That was our grocery store when I was growing up. Hometown Proud. Why can't they be hometown humble, willing to serve you? You know, that's some exalted food. Maybe they should eat some humble pie, right? Proudly serving. You see that everywhere. When you truly have a servant's heart, you are self-sacrificing and humble, not prideful. Sherwood, the Sherwood films. Every one of their movies have this word in them as if it's a good thing because they're only, they're only teaching what they know and they don't know what they should know. Proverbs 8, verse 13. The fear of Yehovah is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy, and the evil way, and the froward mouth do I hate. See that? That's the way God is. So don't say you're going to be proud and be God's people. You're not going to do it. Not in the end. And it won't matter what military you have. It won't matter what you think you have. You got this song by uh, Hank Jr. And I always loved that song growing up. Country Boy Can't Survive. If you, if you listen to that song, you can't run us out. You can't make us run. And, you know, <laughs> I grow my own tomatoes and my own homemade. We can live off the land. How many country people are living off the land? Wake up, people. How many don't even have a garden? Don't know how to make homemade wine. Don't know how to grow a garden. Don't know how to, don't know how to butcher a deer. Don't know how to raise livestock. Yeah, they've left it. Even in the country, they've left it. They're not prepared at all. So when these food shortages come... Even though they've got plenty of food elsewhere, and they lie to everybody, they've got you over a barrel because you you have not kept these good ways. He says, "Return to the old paths." You said, "We won't walk there, and we're not going to do it." I don't want to do that. The grocery store—that's my garden. Wake up! Wake up! Look back. What happened to the Indians? What happened to their food supply, the buffalo? These people didn't wear high tech about nothing. They could drink out of the streams. They had their burnt wood for fire, and everywhere they went, there was that. They followed the buffalo as their food supply. What happened to the buffalo? White man destroyed their food supply. One of the ways was buffalo hunters. Let's raise the price of hides. Pay these guys to go out and kill all the buffalo and leave the carcasses lay and waste them? One way. There's plenty of ways. But here's what I'm saying is they ruin their food supply. So don't give me that crap the country boy can't survive, folks. What happened another time with the Indians? They had Navajo sheep. They called those in an Indian language, but what it means in English is that by which we live. They got their milk, their their clothing, and their meat from those animals. Guess what happened? They started destroying the Navajo. They destroyed their food supply again. Now you can still find them. They're on the. They're not that not a lot of them, but you can still find them. They're making a comeback. Those sheep, but they destroyed their food population. You know what's the bad thing today is. They've destroyed this in the hearts and the minds of the people. Even the country people aren't doing this anymore. To where they don't even have to take them away. You got the big cattle man, the big grain farmer. We'll feed the world. We're supposed to feed ourselves. When will people wake up to this? Give a boy a fish, teach a boy to fish. You got to have both of those in there. Bear your own burden, bear others' burdens. There's not contradictions. You bear your own burden, and that's self responsibility. You be responsible. You and your family, and you teach that to your children. At some point in your life, you're going to need somebody's help, and they're going to help bear your burden. At some point in your life, you're going to have somebody that needs your help, 
and you're going to help bear that burden. But the whole while, everybody trying to bear their own burden, not with pride, but with humility, because we're being obedient to God and being responsible. We're responding to what he's taught us. You give a boy a fish sometimes, and he'll eat for a day. You teach a boy a fish, and he'll eat for life. They've taken away all your abilities to grow your own food and discourage you in doing so. And then they're saying, you can trust us. We'll feed you. And now they're saying we have a food shortage. Wake up! Social security is not the family. They've destroyed the family. Get the men, the women. I, I could go on and on and show you how, how they've, they've tricked and lied and destroyed everybody. If people don't wake up pretty quick, this whole world will be worshiping false gods, bowing the knee to idols, and be a flat-out communist puppet society. Are we there yet? We're to be humble. You may think, well, you're sounding pretty loud. I'm being bold. The righteous are as bold as a lion, the Scripture says. I'm not being arrogant. I'm being bold. I'm not afraid, but I have a fear of God. I don't know if you can understand these things. Philippians 2, 8 through 9. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. Our Savior was not prideful, but bold he was. Do you understand what just happened there? It's like a chessboard. Everybody protects the king. Everybody protects the king. Imagine the king saying, get out of the way. I'm stepping forward. I'm the one you want. Leave them alone. And the rest of the players on the chessboard are in awe. That's what happened, folks. Our king paid the price for us. He died for us. We owe him everything. The devil will never do this. He'll never lay down his life for you. He'll promise you everything and lie to you every step of the way. Quit trusting him. Wherefore God also highly exalted Messiah and give him a name which is above every name. Yahushua. Salvation is from Yehovah. When we humble ourselves, God will exalt us. Yahshua was humble. Matthew twenty three twelve, And whoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. He brought low. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. See, God will do that. We need to let our Father do these things, not ourselves. 1 Peter 5, 6. Humble yourself therefore into the hand of Mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Remember Jesus, or Yeshua said, he said, your time's always right to his brothers. He said, your time's always right. You're always going to try to shine in your little light and be number one. He said, my time hasn't come. When it says in due time, it means in God's time. His time means perfect. We don't make our own time up, folks. Some scripture people use to say there's a good pride. Galatians 6, 4. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. How do we prove that work? By the Spirit of God and the Word of God. It must be built on the foundation of Messiah, or it will be burnt up. When it goes along with what the Scriptures say from Genesis to Revelations, also it's the motive of your heart. The motive of your heart must be to give God glory in Him alone. Then the worker and the work has been proven. See? And the fruit of that will be a heart that rejoices in what God has done through his servant. That's what that chapter, Galatians 6, verse 4 means. But let every man prove his own work, then shall he have rejoice in himself alone and not in another. That not in another doesn't mean God, folks. You have rejoice in himself alone of what God is doing in his life. He's not out there trying to get everybody to see it. He's just happy what the Father's doing in his life. Another place people use is, and they distort, is 2 Corinthians 9, verse 2 through 4. For I know the frowardness of your mind, for which I boast to, you, to them in, of Macedonia, 
that Acacia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked many. Yet have I sent the brother, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that as I said, you may be ready. Lest happily, if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, that we say not ye should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. Proverbs 27. Let another man praise thee, and not thy own mouth, a stranger, not thy own lips. Now that doesn't mean that they should worship us. We are not to receive worship or flattery. Praise and flattery are not the same things. Proverbs 31. Woman is beautiful. Beauty is deceitful, vain. But woman who fears Jehovah shall be praised. See? But she fears him. She's not going to be all prideful. She's going to be humble. Must understand that boasting in someone or praising someone is only based on what work God is doing in them. Not anything that they have done themselves. Otherwise, it would be dishonoring to God. The Bible says no flesh shall glory in his presence. He will not share his glory with another. What people have done is taken verses such as these out of context and distorted them to build false doctrines that go against the true meaning of the verse. And what God has said from Genesis to Revelation about us glorifying him and not ourselves. He says we're supposed to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's 1 Timothy 2.15. That's a big one. I encourage you to do that. He'll keep revealing things to you. Psalm 44, 8. In God, we boast all the day long and praise thy name forever. Selah. See, in him we make our boast. Psalm 34, 2. My soul shall make her boast in Yehovah. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Yeah, the prideful won't, but the humble will. Psalm 94, 4. How long shall they utter and speak hard things? And all the works of iniquity boast themselves. See, they're boasting themselves. See the difference? Psalm 25, 9 through 10. The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. All the paths of Yehovah are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. Be meek. May God bless you as you study his word. May I leave you with this hymn that reminds us to give God the glory. It says, To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his own son, who yielded his, yielded his life as an atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise Jehovah. Praise Jehovah. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise Jehovah. Praise Jehovah. Let the people rejoice. O oh, come to the Father through Yahshua the Son and give him the glory, great things he has done. O oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes. That moment from Yahashua, a pardon receives. Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and great are rejoicing through Yahashua the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport, when Yahashua we see. Thank you for tuning in to Do You Know My Father? I hope that you learned something today. I hope it stirred you into following God and, and learning His ways. Be blessed. <laughs>